Today, I want to welcome Chad Hufford. He is the founder of Veritas Wealth Management, which is based in Anchorage, Alaska. He's helping a lot of people in the oil industry uh, achieve their financial freedom. But there's something, Chad's one of a few people I've met that just devours books. On average, uh, average year, he'll read 120 books. And that is just, that's more than two a week. And so people who do that always fascinate me. I think this is going to be an amazing conversation. So Chad, welcome. Hey, thank you so much, Craig. I appreciate the introduction. Uh, some people might be impressed by the books. Um, my wife just teases me for being a nerd, like all the time. And I tell her, I was like, Tiffany, when you met me, I was finishing up a biochemistry degree. Like, I feel like my cards were on the table. You knew you were getting a dork out of this. So don't don't act like you're surprised that I'm a bit on the nerdy side, but uh, she still likes to tease me about it. So I'm, I'm glad that you appreciate it. Yeah, no, it's it's impressive. You know, I, I just, I'm a slow reader. I don't, I like to read. I don't read that fast. And I'm, in, I'm always impressed by people who do. And, um, and so, uh, what, so what type of books do you, you know, so in the next two weeks, what, what type of books will you be reading? Okay. So I try to read at least one faith-based book every month mm -hmm. and one health or fitness or physiological based book every month. Um, at least one business based book every month. Um, and obviously, you know, some books, some months there's, there's multiples of those, um, sometimes I'll, I'll, I've been trying to read more history, um, and every now and then I'll throw a fiction book in there. I, there's a, there's almost a sense of like guilt, like, oh, this is entertainment. Um, but I think as, as you, as you well know, I mean, reading fiction is, is shown to increase creativity and, uh, kind of expand the way you think. And so, I, I think there's benefits to to all those things, but uh, those are the three categories that I try to hit every single month. Um, right now, um, I'm reading a uh, the the faith based book that I'm reading is really focused on family. Um, it's called Take Back Your Family. Um, I'm reading a book, uh, business related book, uh, by Morgan Housel uh, called The Psychology of Money, which is absolutely fantastic, even if people are not super interested in the money side of it. It's a, it's a very, very well-written book um, as it can be very rare in the financial industry, which I know. Um, so those are the two books I'm working on right now. And uh, I'm not sure what my next one is. I've got a, a couple in the, in the hopper. Um, but uh, one of the ones that I'm looking at is an Eric Larson book. Who's uh, he writes about historical events but he writes so well, you'd swear it was uh, you'd swear it was fiction. So he's got a couple books out there. He's got a new one that uh, it's a big one, but it, it might be my next uh, kind of fun read, so to speak. Well, I'll, I'll throw in two recommendations. One is "Hope That Won't Die." My wife and I co-wrote that, and it's about my near early departure from this world. And the other book is "Make Sales Magical," which. Uh, it's actually not a sales book. It's a marketing book. I, I think I screwed up in the naming of it. Everybody thinks I'm a sales consultant. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm a marketing guy. And when the marketing is done right, the sales are magical. But um, the when I was writing Hope That Won't Die, uh, one Friday night, I was sitting down with a, a mentor of mine, the one that I, I mentioned previously just absolutely berated me. Uh, mm -hmm. in front of a group of people about how horrible my writing was in, in a particular example. And I told them, I said, you know, I, I said, I've written the introduction to the book and I love it. I absolutely love it. And I said, then I wrote the first chapter and I hate the first chapter as much as I love the introduction. And he said, you know, you, you should read Travels with Charlie uh, by John Steinbeck. And he said, it's been, it's never gone out of print since 1960. And it's a travel log. And he said, it's a, the last big thing that he wrote before he died. And he said, it's really well written. And so I downloaded it to my Kindle that night. And then the next morning got on a flight and started reading it on the flight. And within 20 minutes, 
my head was just exploding with words. And so I, I put that down and I mm. started working again on, on uh, hope that won't die and just started clicking. No, I, I think that's fantastic. I mean, it's amazing. Again, the, the creativity that can be initiated with something like that. Um, one of, one of my big regrets of my twenties was assuming that because I was no longer in school, that I was no longer a student. You know, once I graduated in my head, I started telling myself this story that I'm not a student anymore. And it was a really harmful story to tell myself. Um, and I've told my kids, try, I, have, I have six kids uh, and trying to encourage them. Like studying is not something you do because you're in school. It's something you should do because there's so much knowledge to unlock, so much creativity that's inside you that hopefully you are embracing and nurturing throughout your entire life not just between now and when you're 22 and you walk away with a degree that you may or may not be able to use. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you have a, you, you had a term that you used. You said something about intellectual obesity. What is that? Well, it's the idea that some of us take in information and, and this is, this is something where very analytical people, um, people who are avid readers who are heavy into education, I think can get caught up in when we take in information and it could be good, but we don't do anything with it. And just like somebody sitting on the couch and eating, 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 even if they're eating healthy food, at some point, they're going to experience caloric toxicity where it doesn't matter what you're eating. If you eat too much of it, it's going to start causing problems. And if we don't, if we don't take the information that we're that we're devouring and actually apply it to our life, does it really make that much of a difference? So if I read, if I read five books this year on how to be a better husband, but I don't apply any of it, does it make a difference that I even read that book or any of those books? You know, that's kind of the question I ask myself. So I'm I'm trying to have a balance between not just taking in information, but making sure I'm executing it as well. Yeah. No, and that's so valuable. And I, I'll tell you, I just in a moment of honesty, I think that I may be guilty of some of what you're talking about. I love, um, one of my temptations is if I hear about someplace in, in the news or something, I'll dig in and I'll start reading and studying about it. I'm just, just fascinated by it. And, but at the end of that, okay, I know stuff about some obscure place that I'll probably never visit, but it's, uh, I often feel guilty of it, it does feel like that sort of gluttony, intellectual gluttony, that what if I'd taken that time and I'd used it to study something that I could put to work this week? Now, here's here's where it gets really subtle and dangerous, though, when it is something you could put to work this week, but you still don't. When it's something that directly relates to what you could be doing. So in my line of work, it could be a financial planner studying maybe a marketing idea or studying um, economic data, which I, I believe is more destructive, maybe distracting at best. But anyways, but studying something that does relate to their day-to-day -day work, their, uh, their profession. I think that's where it gets the most dangerous because I think a lot of times, Craig, the, I think perfectionism is, is often very well disguised procrastination mm -hmm. by by planning and learning and researching we we give ourselves permission to not act well i just need to study this a little bit more or i just i want to revise i want to revise this draft a couple more times well at some at some point you just got to ship the thing you know some you you have to put that new product that new plan that new idea out in the marketplace and you might have a mentor say craig that was crap that was the worst thing i've ever read but now you can go back and revise it, but nothing is ever going to be perfect. And I think there's, and I'm, I'm preaching to myself right now. There's a lot of people who are so concerned about getting it right, getting it perfect. They sometimes never actually produce the thing. And I've had to remind myself a lot, especially when, when I was writing my book that, that done is better than perfect. There will never be a perfect business plan. There will never be a perfect investment, a perfect budget, a per perfect diet, a perfect workout plan. At some point, we just need to execute. And where I get where that intellectual obesity, um, where it gets me is when it is something that's very much related to what I'm doing. And I've noticed, okay, 
I've read three or four books on this now. I just need to go do the thing. And I can learn as I go. But one of the things that I've had, another thing I've had to remind myself of is we can always learn by doing, but I'll never be able to do by learning. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Well, there's a, one of my favorite quotes uh, ever is by George Patton. And he said, a good plan violently executed today beats a perfect plan executed next week. Yes. And <clears throat> yeah, so another book, if you haven't read it yet, is War, war As I Knew It. His wife compiled uh, letters that he wrote to her during the war. And there's so much wisdom in that. The dude was just wicked smart and very, very practical. He was also the only... Uh, he was the only Allied commander that Field Marshal Rommel actually feared. Mm. But that whole principle of take something, you know, back to what you were talking about, the perfectionism or the procrastination or however that lines up. Get to know enough of a concept and then push it out there and try it instead of constantly perfecting it because it will never be perfect. And so to give you another quote from another World War II general along the same lines, um, Eisenhower said, uh, no plan survives first contact with the enemy. <laughs> so no matter how perfect, I'm doing air quotes for our listeners who can't see us, no matter how perfect your plan appears to be, when it meets the real world, you will realize, okay, there's stuff I've got to revise, I've got to change. But and, and here's where I think my biochemistry background is really powerful for me because I, I am a recovering perfectionist. And if I'm really honest with myself, it wasn't perfection I was after. It was I wanted guarantees against failure. I yeah. wanted, I didn't want to step out into the unknown and experience failure or rejection. So I call it perfectionism, but it, what it really was was fear of the unknown. And what was really good for me about, about biochemistry is we had to run these experiments and they were experiments and we had a, a vision. We had an idea for how we wanted the experiment to, to result. Like what was the outcome? And it almost never was the outcome we wanted, but we weren't so much married to the outcome as much as we were interested in the process to learn as much as we could. Now, it wasn't that we weren't studying. It wasn't that we weren't researching. We put a lot of time and effort into planning the experiment. But once a week, sometimes twice a week, we just have to run these experiments. Sometimes they went well, sometimes they didn't, but we had to run. We always ran the experiments and we, we did prepare, we did plan, but there was a finite limit to it. And at some point we just had to go execute. And then we learned from that process as well. So the learning didn't stop once, once we shipped our product or our idea into the lab, the, it was just a different type of learning. So I think as, as individuals, especially as entrepreneurs, we have to think about it that way. Like, yeah, you're, 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 you don't want you, you don't want to knowingly put a crappy product or a crappy idea out there, but you, you won't learn how good ideas really could impact or how good the idea could be until you get it out there and start revising it, hearing feedback, hearing some criticism. Um, you know, that's why we've got like what iPhone 16 now. I mean, it, it, this wasn't the first version of the iPhone. It's gotten a little bit better every time they've revised it. They've listened to feedback. The technology has improved, but had they waited until they had an iPhone 16, there'd be some other company. We would, Apple might not even be here today. So I think it's just that willingness to, to step into the unknown with something that we know is far from perfect. And we're not, we're not, we're not, committed to mediocrity, but we're also saying, I'm going to put this out there as good as it is right now, as good as I can make it right now with a commitment to make it continually better. And I think that's the differentiator. No, and I like that. I think that's a, you know, it's a really good uh, perspective because one of the things that happens is when you take a step forward, you discover parts of the world that you didn't previously understand. And that's going to adjust your strategy. And I think that ties back into the Eisenhower quote. Um, and, you know, it was like, it made me, when you said that, I laughed because it made me wonder if uh, Mike Tyson was reading Eisenhower because Mike Tyson said, everybody has a plan until you get punched in the face, mm -hmm. which is almost exactly the Eisenhower. It's the same quote. idea. Yeah. Yep. 
But that's the thing. You take a step forward and you learn something. And, um, but you have to, you have to get it out there. You have to get the idea out there. I mean, the original iPad was basically a $500 solitaire tablet. It, it did nothing. There were no apps for it. It did nothing. You know, for 500 bucks, you could play a few stupid games. And yeah, I remember, I, you know, somebody in my family got one of the original iPads. I said, hey, can I check it out? And I did. And I was like, I looked at it. I was like, what do you do with this? And he said, eh, I play games. And, uh, but they got it out there and became a platform where people started developing for the app store. And the second generation was way more powerful. And the same story is true with the iPhone. Uh, the, the first generation iPhone it was supposed to be a data phone and it completely sucked as a data phone. Mm. Uh, the second, I mean, I remember sitting in a, in a restaurant in Fredericksburg, Texas with somebody and he was sitting there with his iPhone pulling up a web page and you're just sitting there watching it slowly grind. And he's like, when this comes up, it's going to look really cool. And we're just sitting there waiting and waiting and waiting. It sucked as a data phone, but he got it out there, got, you know, and, and was able to learn from that and then make uh, the next, you know, I think the next one was the iPhone 3G, which was a lot better. Yeah, and I think to your point, we can get so focused on being perfect rather than committing to those iterations about, you know, slowly getting, it's it's not so much about where we are. It's a lot of times the the direction we're headed. Are we constantly improving? Are, are we becoming better? Are our businesses improving? And, and I think in, in business, um, you hear these gurus talking about, you know, feel no fear and, you know, be fearless in the marketplace. I just don't know that that's great advice because I don't, if, if we wait until we don't feel fear, we're going to sit on our ideas all day long. Like yeah. our, our ideas will never be put out there. Cause I think, I think it's stepping forward with that fear. And I, I believe that a action is one of the great antidotes to fear. And in inaction is, I, I think, a, a, a garden of fear. I mean, the, the longer we sit on, on inaction and we procrastinate, we think of all the what ifs, all the bad things that can happen, all the criticism, that fear just grows. It, it nurtures fear. But, but I think action can dispel it. Well, encourage has no meaning in the absence of fear. Exactly. It's impossible for you to be courageous unless you're scared. Then you're just stupid. <laughs> you know? Yeah. If, if there's no fear, you're reckless. You don't, you don't want to go into battle with somebody who's fearless. He's going to get you all killed. Yeah. You need fear, but you need, you need to be in control of your fear and have it as an ally not as not as a dictator. And I think too often fear can dictate what we do rather than be a consideration. It, it should influence what we do, but it shouldn't control what we do. So your your specialty is obviously growing wealth and and what have you. And and so speaking of fear, let's the the economy right now, there's so many people talking about what's going on with the economy. Is it should they sit on cash? Should they not sit on cash? It's there is a lot of fear around the economy. And what what would be your advice as somebody who's looking at the financial markets every day and keeping your head in that space? So you're you're absolutely correct. There's a tremendous amount of uncertainty right now, and there's another time that this reminds me of. Um, and it's every other day that I've been alive. There is always un uncertainty. And if you think about even just the last 50 years, we had um, you know, just over 50 years ago, Nixon left the, the office, uh, presidential office uh, with Watergate scandal. We had OPEC uh, and the oil embargoes, the energy crisis going on. You had crazy inflation starting to build up throughout the 70s. Um, meanwhile, interest rates were starting to, to climb, not unlike some of the things we're dealing with right now. That was with the entire backdrop of the Soviet Union and the Cold War. And then we go into the 1980 and there's assassination attempt on Ronald Reagan. You had um, the, the just before that, the rescue attempt 
um, of the Iranian hostages, which went horrible. It's actually the first uh, Delta Force operation. Um, you had uh, the, the saving the loans collapse in the, in the 90s. You had in 1970, you had the biggest single day stock market crash. Uh, I mean, we're, we're not even halfway between 1970 and now. And like all this stuff, you had the, the, uh, the Gulf War, uh, all these different things. Like the world is always uncertain. It's always scary. And what's different, I think, about today is because of the technology we just talked about, we can hear about all of the uncertainty, all the bad things faster than ever before. And I just don't know if we are hardwired to be able to deal with that much potential bad, potential harm um, that we're able to have at our fingertips on a moment's notice. I don't, I, I mean, this is all very new. It's just been the last 10 or 15 years we've had this type of access to so much bad news and doom and gloom. And I don't think the human psyche is is designed to handle it. Well, let's go back to this iPhone story. I'm saying in the restaurant in Fredericksburg, for you to look up at what was going on in the stock market was would take like 60 seconds of download time. Now it's instant. Yes. And so you can you can scare the crap out of yourself in a split second, any exactly. time of day you want. Yep. Yeah. Anything bad in the world going on right now, you can find all about it instantaneously. And anything that might be bad in the future, you can find out about it instantaneously. And what it does is it distracts us from our long-term goals. And it distracts us from our own agency. People get so focused on what's going on around them that they forget to, to put effort and time and energy into what they can actually control. And we give away our power. We give away our agency and we give away our control. Wow. So what would you recommend to businesses who would say, look, I'm just trying to make good, thoughtful decisions for my business because I have a payroll to meet. You know, my decisions impact the lives of others. What would you tell them? The same thing I would tell investors um, is have some clear goals, some clear objectives for what you want your life or your business to look like. And then reverse engineer that. We want to have a plan. You know, you wouldn't want to live in a house that was built without a blueprint. You wouldn't want a, a financial plan or a business that doesn't have a blueprint as well. So the way I think of it, Craig, is if you have a plan, you can act on a plan. If you don't have a plan, you're more likely to react to the crazy world around us. So having a plan, even if that plan changes, we already talked about no plan survives first contact with the enemy. But what it does is it gives you something to proactively work towards. So you're less likely to, to react or respond to all the uncertainty around us. And then, then you can iterate, right? Um, but a lot of people don't have that. They're making business decisions based on emotions or peer pressure or whatever. They really don't have a design for where my actions today line up with my desired business three, five, 10, 15 years down the road. And it's it's like asking for directions without a destination. Well, this road looks fine and this road looks fine and that road has a few more potholes. So I'm not going to go down that road. But what if that road is the most, the, the road with the potholes? That's all we can see, but that road is the most direct path. If we don't have a destination, it's really hard to, to take the right directions. And I think a lot of people, a lot of businesses don't have clear destinations for the, where they want to end up even five years down the road. So they aren't being proactive. They're being very reactionary. And rarely do we make good decisions, good long-term decisions, when we're reacting to the emotional triggers in our, in our environment. You know, we did uh, a number of years ago, we were marketing a financial newsletter. And so in our research, uh, we, we found some beh behavioral economics uh, data on uh, individual stock pickers. And it was really interesting what came out of that. And I'm tr trying to remember the exact language, but basically um, the, the behavior of the individual investors was heavily influenced. They prided themselves as being pioneers, but they were really part of a herd. Mm -hmm. And when everybody was telling them to sell, they would sell. When everybody was saying to buy, they would buy. And it always put them at a disadvantage. Uh, they would hold on to losers and sell winners. And it was just all these behaviors that 
was really responding to the herd mentality rather than like you're saying, setting that destination to say, hey, you know what? I know on average, you know, over five years, this is what I should expect. And I'm just going to stick to it or I'm going to hand, put it in the hands of somebody like uh, Veritas to kind of map that out for me, take me out of the emotional equation and just stick to that path. Well, and just to use that metaphor of the herd, I think that's perfect because if you don't know where you're going, the most likely path is the one that everybody else is on. Like if if I don't know where I want to end up, if I don't know where I should go, I'm just going to follow everybody else, follow the crowd. Like that, I think that is the path of least resistance. If I don't have clear direction, I'm just going to go with a large group of people. And what's difficult about that, what's harmful about that is too often we would rather be wrong in a crowd than be right by ourselves. Um, and, and we have normalized in our world unhealthy behavior, whether it's bad, bad diets, bad workout plans, bad financial decisions. I mean, we've normalized being broke, depressed, in debt, lonely, frustrated, like all those things, obese, all those things have been normalized in our culture. That's the herd. We have to be willing to to break off from the herd, but we have to know where it is we want to go. And when you talk about following the herd from a business standpoint, if I'm a business owner and I'm following what everybody else is doing, they have they might have different business goals. They might have a different business strategy. They might have a completely different market than I do, even if they're in my same industry. And it'd be like following somebody else's directions and wondering why you got lost. You have, you have a different destination. You have a different starting place, but you still follow their direct directions you're dancing to somebody else's music and it, it's frustrating. It can be, it can be painful and so many people are doing it. So I think having a vision, again, this isn't set in stone. This isn't chipping it into to blocks and having, you know, Moses carry him down the mountain, but it's a vision of where you want your business to be in three years, five years, 10 years, and then trying to reverse engineer those decisions and say, okay, here's the choices I'm making today. How does that line up with where I said I wanted to be in five and 10 years? It's a really good question to ask ourselves. Is it perfect? No. Are you still going to make mistakes? Absolutely. Can you still learn from those mistakes? Sure. But it gives you a construct. I think you said it earlier. It's, it's like guardrails. You're putting up guardrails and you automatically limit the universe of decisions because so many of the, the choices out there don't line up with where you're trying to get to. Now, the decision you might make may or may not work. To getting you closer to your long-term goal, but you can eliminate the the large majority of potential decisions because you know right now they don't line up at all with your goals and where you're trying to get to. Yeah. Well, and something I run into periodically is I'll have a client who says, look, our competition is doing this. Why don't we just copy that? And there's a couple of problems with that is one, when you do that, you're mathematically limiting yourself to being average. Uh, the other problem I said, how do you know what you're copying is one of their successes? What if what you're copying is one of their failures? Oh my gosh. You know, it's, it, here's where I see it in, in my industry. And it's so true is you, you could be copying somebody else's mistakes and not know it. And in what we have in our world right now, so just, I'm going to go in, into personal finance for just a moment, if I may, but what we see is not wealth. We see consumption. So when somebody is posting on Instagram the the exotic vacation they they went on, or they're standing in front of their their new car, or um, giving you a tour of their their big beautiful house, that's not wealth. If 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 you pull up to my house in a two hundred fifty thousand dollar car, I don't know if you're wealthy or if you're just in a lot of debt. What I do know is you have two hundred fifty thousand dollars less than you used to have. That's it. Yeah. You know, but, but that's what we look at. And that's what, especially this younger generation, uh, you know, people in their twenties, thirties are chasing, they're chasing consumption, not financial freedom. What we see is the exact opposite of wealth. We see is people spending their wealth, spending their money on things. And, and it's, it, it it's exactly what you just said. It, we're copying other people's mistakes. Like, oh, I see this person who appears to be wealthy driving this really nice car. I need a really nice car. No, it's the this exact wrong thing to do, but it's the obvious thing. And that's what gets people's attention. Yeah. 
you know, Austin, Austin's changed a lot. But when I first moved here, Austin was famous for what they called the Oak Hill Millionaires. Oak Hill is a district a region in Southwest Austin. And the basic advice was, if you see some guy that looks at a bum, looks like a bum sitting, having lunch next to you, most likely he's worth many times what you're, you're worth. And my wife worked at a bank before we met. She worked at a bank and she said, there's this kind of homeless looking guy that would come in on Fridays and make a large cash withdrawal. And finally, one day she's like, who is this guy? Because he just, he looked homeless. He had none of the trappings of wealth. And they said, oh, that's Tito of Tito's Vodka. Uh, he likes to gamble oh on gosh. the weekends. And he was just, that was his gambling money. They would pick up every week. Not that that was not that I'm exhibit, you know, shown as prudence, but his, everything else about him didn't say, you know, he wasn't wearing the Rolex watch. He wasn't wearing the you know, expensive suit. He wasn't driving the expensive car. And, and what, and what we see, even for the people that do have wealth, what we notice are the trappings of that success, not all the sacrifices that they made to get there. Yeah. We see we see the side effects of their wealth, not the causes. And it could be very misleading to a lot of people. Yeah. Chad, I boy, I we could go on forever. I'm just I'm absolutely loving this conversation. And and maybe we we do it again because I just think you have so much wisdom. But Real quick, you have a book out there called Forging Financial Freedom. What's that about and why should people get it? It's a book that's more about mindset and taking control of the trajectory of your life. I'm applying it to finances, but so much of what we talked about today, I touch on in, the, in that book because, uh, as I mentioned, we have normalized a lot of bad behavior in many areas of life and in our culture. They're, what is normal, what the herd is doing is not the direction we want to go. So what this book does is to free people up from feeling like they have to follow what everybody else is doing to create their own path and to pursue financial independence, to pursue freedom. Because what I've seen is when people experience freedom and victory in their financial life, then that has a ripple effect into many, many other areas. Because what I'm ultimately after is people experiencing abundance. And I'm not just talking about abundance from a money standpoint, but autonomy and meaningful pursuit and the ability to chase what matters most in their life. That's what I'm after. And that's what this book is going to help people do. Awesome. And and how do folks find you? Uh, Veritas Alaska is our veritasalaska.com. And we're not just based in, in Alaska. I mean, it's where we were founded. We've got folks all over the United States that we help. And then we're veritas.alaska on Instagram. We're trying to every day post encouraging, uplifting, and educational content. Wow. Chad, this has just been such an exciting conversation. And um, I think we may have to have you back again. I, um, But thank you for coming on Leaders and Legacies. Greg, it's been a pleasure. I've enjoyed our conversations and it's an honor to be able to speak to you and your audience.